Greetings and welcome to the Sportsman's Warehouse fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow a formal presentation. If anyone should acquire operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I'd like to turn the conference over to your host, Rachel Schachter of ICR. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. With me on the call is John Barker, Chief Executive Officer, and Robert Julian, Chief Financial Officer. Before we get started, I would like to remind you of the company's safe harbor language. The statements we make today will contain forward-looking statements within the meaning of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, which includes statements regarding our expectations about our future results of operations, demand for our products, and growth of our industry. Actual future results may differ materially from those suggested in such statements due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those described under the caption, risk factors in the company's 10K for the year ended February 2nd, 2019, and the company's other filings made with the SEC. We will also disclose non-GAAP financial measures during today's call. Definitions of such non-GAAP measures, as well as reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are provided as supplemental financial information in our press release included as Exhibit 99.1 to the Form 8K we furnished to the SEC today, which is also available on the Investor Relations section of our website at investors.sportsons.com. I would also like to note that today's materials include an earnings conference call presentation, which is also available at sportsmans.com in the investor relations section of our website. You can utilize this deck to follow along with today's prepared remarks. Now I'd like to turn the call over to John Barker, Chief Executive Officer of Sportsman's Warehouse. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I hope you, your families, friends, colleagues are all well. Every day it seems that COVID-19 reaches a new milestone. As such, I'll begin my remarks by addressing the COVID-19 situation as it pertains to Sportsman's Warehouse. I will then review the highlights of our fourth quarter and full year 2019 performance and discuss key trends we are seeing in our business. I will also provide updates on our omni-channel growth strategy. Robert will then review our Q4 and fiscal year 2019 financial results in more detail and provide a framework for how we are approaching Q1 and full year 2020. Finally, we will open up the call for questions. I'm now on slide four of the presentation and will address the COVID-19 pandemic. First and most importantly, our efforts are focused on protecting the health and safety of our associates, customers, and their families. To this end, we have instituted several changes to our store operations including reduced store hours to allow for sufficient time to restock and perform additional cleaning, limiting the number of customers in our stores at any one time to assist in social distancing protocols, and leveraging our e-commerce capabilities like Ship to Home, Bopus, and now curbside pickup. As you are aware, the situation remains fluid, and we are closely monitoring new developments. I want to share with you the business impacts we've seen so far. With respect to our supply chain, we've seen some interruption out of China, primarily related to camping and fishing products. We've not yet seen a significant financial impact due to these supply chain disruptions. We are working closely with our vendors to limit this disruption, but we may not be able to fully mitigate its impact. On the demand side, there is significant uncertainty on the duration and near-term impact as it relates to whether our stores will be able to remain open during this pandemic. However, we are confident that everything we've done over the past few years has positioned Sportsman's Warehouse to capture significant market share in the long term. Due to this unprecedented situation, we are not issuing guidance for either Q1 or fiscal year 2020 at this time. But I do want to share a few key points and trends. Our business returned to normal and even accelerated starting in early January as key competitors exited or de-emphasized the firearms and ammunition categories. 
we've experienced further acceleration of sales into Q1 2020. We believe this is driven by fewer competitors, increased demand from COVID-19 uncertainty, and the current election cycle, although parsing out the exact contribution of each is not possible. While we've seen significant increases in sales in the first quarter so far, this is likely not sustainable in the long term. The COVID-19 pandemic may result in more store closings due to government regulations, a substantial decrease in store traffic due to social distancing, or a significant disruption in our supply chain. But rest assured, we are actively working on contingency plans and are managing our capital, expenses, and liquidity with great discipline given these uncertainties. Now on slide five, I'll review our fourth quarter results which exceeded the high end of our updated sales guidance and met the high end of our updated EPS guidance. For the quarter, net sales were $258 million or an increase of 6.4% compared to prior year. This sales growth was driven primarily by three factors. First, we experienced strong firearm and ammunition sales in January. Second, we added 11 new stores during 2019, including eight field and stream stores acquired at the end of Q3. And third, we've seen significant growth in sales generated by our website, sportsmans.com. While same-store sales decreased 4.8% in the fourth quarter, this performance was better than our, out, than our updated outlook. Not only did business trends normalize in January, they exceeded our updated expectations. When Walmart completed its exit of certain ammunition categories and other competitors' promotional behavior returned to normal, we experienced market share gains in our key categories of firearms and ammunition. Also, sales generated from our website increased 90% during the holiday season versus prior year. This strong growth was driven by our expansive online assortment and scale, which provides us with the opportunity to bring products to market that no one else can deliver. We are also seeing a significant increase in BOPAS orders and have made nice progress on rolling out ship from store for all relevant categories. This Capability enables us to reduce shipping time to customers, maximize customer choices online, and successfully manage our long tail inventories. Finally, our geographic reach is further enhanced by our growing base of federal firearms licensed partners, which expanded to over 300 during the quarter. When combined with our store footprint, we are now able to reach 90% of the U.S. population within a 45 minute drive. Operating expenses for the quarter were slightly higher than anticipated due to additional marketing spend around the holiday season and the new store openings. In addition, we deleveraged in operating expenses due to reduced sales during the three weeks leading up to Christmas. Adjusted earnings per share were 21 cents for the fourth quarter, which met the high end of our updated guidance. For full year 2019, net sales were $886 million dollars or an increase of 4.4%, and adjusting, adjusted earnings per share were 47 cents. Turning now to slide six, we are committed to this industry and will continue to grow online and expand our physical store footprint while our, while our national competitors are de-emphasizing and or exiting firearms and ammunition. We ended 2019 with 103 Sportsman's Warehouse stores in 27 states. We've already announced five new stores for 2020, and today we are announcing two additional new stores for 2020. Included in the seven total new stores, there are two field and stream locations located in Crescent Springs, Kentucky, and Kalamazoo, Michigan. This brings us to a total of 10 field and stream stores acquired in 2019 and 2020. As part of the seven new stores now announced, We also secured two previous Gander stores, one in Parker, Colorado that is already open and another which is a brand new announcement today in Marquette, Michigan, which is planned to open this summer. The second newest store announcement today is the planned opening of our first small format concept shop of approximately 7,500 square feet 
which is located in Laramie, Wyoming. If successful, this smaller store format could offer additional opportunities to penetrate underserved markets that couldn't support a larger format store. We view this concept as an advantage over our national competitors who build larger stores at higher costs. In addition to the new Sportsman's Warehouse stores, we recently opened our first indoor range and retail facility in West Jordan, Utah. This new retail concept and indoor range is branded Legacy Shooting Center. In summary, as found on slide seven, we are closely monitoring the COVID-19 situation in real time to protect the health and well-being of our associates, but we cannot fully predict its impact on our business. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding COVID-19, we are very pleased with the momentum of our core business as we begin fiscal 2020, and we remain focused on our growth initiatives. Importantly, long-term, we are uniquely positioned to capitalize on market share opportunities given our growing brand, expanding store base, and enhanced reach through e-commerce. We expect to report on Q1 2020 results in June. With that, I'll turn the call over to Robert to discuss our financial results in more detail. Thank you, John. I'll begin my remarks today with a review of our fourth quarter in fiscal year 2019 results, followed by a few remarks about fiscal year 2020. Most of the financial figures discussed on today's call are reported on a U.S. GAAP basis. In the instances where we report non-GAAP financial measures, we have reconciled the non-GAAP measures to the corresponding GAAP measures in our earnings press release, which was issued earlier today. Turning to slide eight of the PowerPoint presentation, fourth quarter 2019 net sales were $258.2 million, compared to $242.7 million in the fourth quarter of 2018, an increase of $15.5 million, or 6.4%. Same-store sales decreased 4.8% in the quarter, compared to our updated guidance range of negative 6% to negative 7%. The most challenging product categories in Q4 were clothing, camping, and footwear. However, our sales performance rebounded nicely starting in early January, led by ammunition and firearms. Same store sales of ammunition and firearms increased 17.6% and 10.0% respectively in the month of January. Overall, same store sales growth in January was positive 1.7%. Q4 2019 gross profit was $85.0 million compared to $79.5 million in the fourth quarter of 2018, an increase of $5.5 million or 6.9%. Gross margin was relatively flat for the quarter at 32.9% versus 32.8% in their prior year period. Product margin improved 80 basis points, primarily due to the discount we received on the inventory acquired in the acquisition of eight field and stream stores in Q3. Gross margin was negatively impacted by 80 basis points in the quarter due to reduced vendor incentives as a result of lower total purchases. SG&A expense of $71.8 million for Q4 2019 was an increase of $3.9 million, or 14.9%, compared to the fourth quarter of 2018. We incurred additional payroll expense of $3.1 million, primarily due to minimum wage and benefit increases, plus new store growth. Rent expense increased approximately $2.8 million, primarily due to new store openings. Other operating expense increased approximately $2.3 million, primarily due to incremental marketing, software support, and audit fees. Store operating expense, including utilities, janitorial, and security expenses, increased due to new store opening. We also incurred $0.5 million of incremental pre-opening expenses and transaction costs associated with the field and stream transactions. As a percentage of net sales, SG&A increased approximately 200 basis points to 27.8% in the quarter. Income from operations was $13.2 million in Q4 2019 compared to $17.0 million in the prior year. Interest expense in Q4 2019 was $1.4 million, 
compared to 2.7 million in Q4 of 2018, a reduction of $1.3 million. This improvement is the result of lower total borrowings, primarily attributable to working capital improvements. We recorded income tax expense of $2.1 million in Q4 2019, compared to $3.7 million in Q4 2018. This $1.3 million reduction is the result of several discrete items impacting the Q4 2019 tax provision, including R&D tax credits, state inventory tax credits, and changes in state deferred tax rates. Net income for the quarter was $9.7 million, or $0.22 per share, based on a weighted average share count of $43.3 million, as compared to net income of $10.6 million, or $0.25 per share, based on a weighted average share count of $43.0 million in 2018. Adjusted net income was $9.3 million, or $0.21 per diluted share, based on a diluted weighted average share count of $43.8 million, in the fourth quarter of 2019, compared to adjusted net income of $10.6 million or 25 cents per diluted share, based on a diluted weighted average share count of 43.1 million in 2018. Adjusted EBITDA for the fourth quarter of 2019 was $19.6 million compared to 22.0 million in the prior year period. Turning to slide nine, I will now comment on our full year 2019 results. Fiscal year 2019 net sales were $886.4 million compared to $849.1 million in 2018, an increase of $37.3 million or 4.4%. Same store sales decreased 0.9% in fiscal year 2019. This compares to our updated full year guidance of negative 1.3% to negative 1.7% for the year. We ended the fiscal year with 103 stores operating in 27 states. Total square footage grew 13.6% in fiscal year 2019 compared to 2018. Full year 2019 gross profit was $296.6 million compared to $284.9 million in 2018 an increase of $11.7 million, or 4.1%. Gross margin was relatively flat at 33.5% versus 33.6% in the prior year period. Product margin improved 30 basis points for the year, primarily due to the discount we received on the inventory purchased in the Q3 acquisition of eight field and stream stores. Gross margin was negatively impacted by 40 basis points for the year, due to reduced vendor incentives as a result of lower total purchases. SG&A expense of $263.2 million for fiscal year 2019 was an increase of $22.3 million, or 9.2% compared to 2018. We incurred additional payroll expense of $8.3 million, primarily due to minimum wage and benefit increases, plus new store growth. Rent expense increased $5.8 million, primarily due to new store openings. Other operating expense increased approximately $5.6 million, primarily due to incremental marketing, software support, and audit fees. Store operating expense increased due to new store openings. We incurred $1.4 million of incremental pre-opening expenses in transaction costs associated with the acquired field and stream stores. Depreciation expense increased $1.1 million in 2019 compared to prior year. As a percentage of net sales, SG&A increased approximately 130 basis points to 29.7%. Income from operations was $33.5 million for fiscal year 2019 compared to $44.0 million in the prior period. Interest expense for fiscal year 2019 was $8.0 million dollars compared to $13.2 million in 2018, a reduction of $5.2 million. This improvement is the result of lower total borrowings, primarily attributable to inventory reduction and other working capital improvements. We recorded income tax expense of $5.3 million for fiscal year 2019, compared to $7.1 million in 2018, 
The year-over-year reduction is primarily attributable to the discrete Q4 tax benefits addressed in my earlier remarks. Net income for fiscal year 2019 was $20.2 million, or 47 cents per share, based on a weighted average share count of 43.2 million. As compared to net income of 23.7 million, or 55 cents per share, based on a weighted average share count of 42.9 million in 2018. Adjusted net income was $20.6 million, or 47 cents per share, based on a diluted weighted average share count of 43.5 million in fiscal year 2019 compared to adjusted net income of $25.9 million, or $0.60 cents per share, based on a diluted weighted average share count of $43.0 million in 2018. Adjusted EBITDA for fiscal year 2019 was $59.0 million, compared to $68.5 million in the prior year. Turning now to slide 10 in our balance sheet. Fiscal year 2019 ending inventory was $276 million, compared to $277 million at the end of last year, a $1 million reduction. This result was achieved despite adding 11 new stores in 2019. On a per-store basis, inventory was down 11.0% compared to prior year. We incurred $7.5 million of capital expenditures in the fourth quarter of 2019, compared to $2.7 million in Q4 2018 an increase of $4.8 million. This increase was primarily associated with the build-out of our new corporate headquarters and our new legacy shooting center. Full year 2019 capital expenditures were $20.9 million compared to $17.9 million in 2018. Fiscal year 2019 operating cash flow was $77.9 million versus $32.2 million for 2018. The $45.8 million improvement in operating cash flow year over year is primarily due to a reduction in working capital. Our liquidity remains strong as we ended the year with $116.1 million in outstanding borrowings on the line of credit and approximately $44.3 million availability on the revolving credit facility. The outstanding balance on our revolving line of credit was $28.2 million lower at the end of 2019 compared to the same period last year, even while utilizing this facility to fund the acquisition of eight new field and stream stores in Q3 2019. The outstanding balance on our long-term debt was $29.7 million at the end of fiscal year 2019 compared to $35.6 million at year-end 2018 a reduction of $5.9 million. Finally, I would like to make a few comments on fiscal year 2020. As John noted in his remarks, we are not providing forward guidance at this time due to uncertainty surrounding the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the short term, we have certainly experienced unusually high demand for many of our products, including generators, dehydrated food, water filtration, propane, first aid supplies, firearms, and ammunition. Most of our stores remain open at this time so that we can provide our customers access to these essential items. However, we recognize that this situation is fluid. It could change very rapidly. Therefore, we are also actively developing contingency plans and manage our cash, inventory, expenses, and liquidity very closely. We feel confident that we have sufficient financial flexibility to weather the potential for negative impact to our business in the future due to COVID-19. We will update you again and hope to provide more clarity on our next earnings call in June. With that, I will now turn the call back over to the operator for questions. Great, thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to move your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. 
first question here is from Brian Sigal from Craig Callum. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, guys, and thanks for taking our questions. Uh, John, you mentioned significant sales growth quarter to date, um, as well as, um, you know, later mentioning a bunch of categories. Uh, Robert, were you able to quantify what same-source sales and e-commerce performance was quarter to date in Q1? Ryan, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, what I can say is we've seen unprecedented demand in our stores uh, quarter to date for the products that um, Robert mentioned. The last few weeks has caused us to take a lot of actions within our stores to service as many of our loyal customers as we can, given the significant demand for those products. We've turned off all of our third-party shipping to third-party partners to protect customers in our stores. We've limited firearms and ammunition quantities per customer per day to meet those needs. Uh, we've taken uh, some of the product that was shipped to home um, off of our website and made it ship to store only. And in a handful of stores, Ryan, where we're unable to uh, serve customers directly, we're using our website to do uh, curbside pickup um, where necessary. So we're not providing exact numbers today, but I, we can tell you that it's been unprecedented the demand we've seen um, so far quarter to date in certain categories. And then maybe from a supply chain, um, you mentioned some stuff coming from China, but what are you seeing from the major gun and am, ammo manufacturers? Or, or I guess, so differently, I guess, why are you limiting purchases of those? Is that a, a demand or supply issue constraint? Uh, it began as a demand issue primarily. Um, now as we look at the supply chain, we have a mix of activity happening across the manufacturers, and I, I'm speaking of the U.S.-based manufacturers. We have uh, some manufacturing and distribution facilities that have been impacted by a limitation of um, operating by government uh, requirements. We've had some factories that are on reduced output due to attendance, and we have a few factories that are outputting more than they have in many years as they've ramped up. It's really a mix. I would tell you most of our manufacturers have been able to ramp up production and keep up, uh, but this is a fluid situation which we are um, keeping an eye on. The flow of new product in these key categories, and again, this is not just firearms and ammunition, but I'll call it primarily firearms and ammunition, is happening in our DC. We've had good attendance in our DC, good throughput. Um, the trucks are, are arriving um, with that product, and we are redispersing those out to the store. So we're, we're uh, optimistic that the manufacturers can keep up with this. Our position and market share that we have already, Ryan, has given us the ability to work with these vendors for many years. They had forecast from us, and as we saw demand ramp up, uh, we're having top-to-top -to -top conversations on a regular basis to ensure that we can secure as much inventory as possible to serve as many of the Sportsman's Warehouse loyal customers as we can. That's awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, one more for me, and then I'll turn it over uh, to the others. So you acquired four stores from Field and Stream and Gander. Uh, it appeared to be at a nice discount, uh, but anything you can share about the terms uh, of those deals and then potential to acquire any more of those stores from them? Yeah, so, uh, Ryan, this is Robert. Um, the two stores that we acquired, uh, the two Field and Stream stores that we acquired were very similar deals to the first eight um, so we did receive a discount on inventory in this case. Uh, it was a little bit less than in the previous uh, transaction. Uh, we did acquire the assets of those uh, locations uh, for very little uh, investment. Um, and so uh, the deal, the, that transaction was very similar to the first eight. Uh, the Gander. The Gander, uh, we, we referenced the Gander as facilities that were Gander. They weren't necessarily a purchase agreement. That was more of a real estate opportunity. One in Parker, Colorado, um, which on the front range, a fantastic fit for us. It is a larger store. It is open and operating. 
The other one I referenced, which we are announcing today, is Marquette, Michigan. That was a Gander store that's been closed. Uh, we've come to terms with the landlord and are opening that later in the year um, in uh, northern Michigan. So those deals are a little different. We're not acquiring inventory. And, yeah, they were not an ADA. It's more of a real just, estate Right, a location. Play. It's a local real estate play uh, from a Gander that's been exited at some point in the last few months or last couple of years. Got it. Got it. Thanks, guys. Uh, congrats on the, the solid finish of the quarter and, and quarter date. Good luck. Thanks, Ryan. Our next question is from Peter Keith from Piper Sander. Please go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, so, uh, John and Robert, it sounds like you don't want to give us a quarter-to-date same-store sales, but I guess you, you did characterize it as unprecedented demand. I think if we go back uh, to um, you know, certain quarters around late 2012, you guys at that time did uh, post same store sales, I think around 40% or higher. Are we talking about there, there's a new kind of quarter to date would be uh, above that level if we're unprecedented? Uh, Peter, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not familiar with those types of uh, same store growth rates, the, the 40% that you're uh, referencing. I can tell you that of some of the products that uh, I mentioned earlier in terms of growth rates, some of them are growing double digits. There are product categories that are actually growing in triple digits. Um, the only reason why we're reluctant uh, to give the quarter to date number is just uh, how fluid this situation and it can change very quickly. Uh, we'd be a little bit concerned about over exuberance, I guess I would say. Um, but we are seeing very, very, in, you know, it's also one of the reasons we're, we're not giving guidance. We could give such a large range for an expectation. I mean, if our stores were closed down for the rest of the quarter, we could actually see negative same store sales growth in the quarter. If things continue the way they're at, we can see significant double digit same store sales growth in the quarter. So it's just such a fluid uh, situation. We feel like giving specific quarter to date uh, information might be misleading or not particularly helpful. Yeah, it's a, it's a much different situation, Peter, than 2012 or 2013. Uh, those were specific events driven or political events were driven to certain categories because of concerns of regulatory. This is a different dynamic in the consumer's mind. Um, we are seeing categories, again, up double, triple digits that we would not have seen in 2012 or 13. They're just not, it's not the same need from a consumer standpoint. Uh, what I can tell you is that um, we are bringing a lot of net new consumers into Sportsman's Warehouse looking for goods, uh, not just firearms and ammunition, but there are a lot of new customers seeking personal protection around handguns and ammunition, pepper spray and bear spray, and we believe that in the long term will be good for the industry and sportsman's warehouse. Okay, thanks. That actually does address a, another question I want to ask around new, uh, new customers. Um, so it sounds like that's trending pretty well. Uh, curious how um, the uh, the new uh, credit card offering is uh, participating in this environment. That are, are you able to cross sell that and get an up uptick of uh, new applicants? We are, Peter. Uh, you know, we're we're in the uh, I'll call it the fourth quarter of the integration of that program into our technology at the point of sale and the website. Uh, the training and the marketing materials are make we're making good progress. The uh, acceptance rate from uh, the provider is exceeding our initial uh, expectations. So we're pleased with performance to this date. Uh, we are bringing a lot, as I said, new customers in to Sportsman's Warehouse being introduced to the brand and our consumer, our uh, employees, and getting a lot of new customers into our overall loyalty database. So we're pleased with the performance we've seen to date. Okay, and maybe lastly, just Sort of mixing it all together, I think a lot of the categories you're calling out strength might be on average a little bit lower margin. 
uh, it, just fair to say maybe the mix will, will pressure gross margin uh, quarter to date, but is it very simple to say that at least you're, from a gross profit dollar standpoint, the, the growth is also quite strong? Yeah, so, uh, Peter, that's correct. Uh, we are mixing into products that uh, the gross margin is lower than our company average, and so we are seeing a mix effect to, for that. And it could be fairly significant. It could be 100 to 150 basis points uh, pressure on gross margin. And so uh, in some ways it's, it, it could wash to some degree on the gross profit line that we can see uh, higher revenue but sort of similar gross profit dollars uh, had this event not occurred and we had not seen a shift in mix, at least in the short term. We don't expect that our mix will continue uh, at this level of being so heavy in firearms and ammunition in the long run, but in the short run, that is certainly a dynamic we're seeing in the Q1 results so far. Uh, Robert, if I may add, um, we, are, we have made incredible strides in our organization over the last year, getting our inventory health in great shape. And as we exited 2019, our clearance event in January on apparel was actually much smaller than it had been in prior years because we were had a healthier set of inventory. We've also done a great job in partnering with our vendors and making sure our terms and first cost of goods are in place. And every category in this, every department or category in this company is up individually in margin, product margin, so far quarter to date. But the heavy mix into the categories we referenced and away from, say, things such as footwear and apparel will put pressure on the overall product margin in the short term. So really proud of what the team has done over the last year to put us in this position. Uh, they have all categories up in, in product margin. The mix is certainly going to be different than we would have ever forecasted going in to Q1. Yeah, I'm glad uh, okay. Tom brought that up. Every product category is actually experiencing expansion on a rate basis uh, across our portfolio. And so we're going to have positive product margin and negative mix, and more or less that might be a wash on a rate basis overall. Okay, that's great detail. Appreciate the insights and good luck. Thanks, Thanks Peter. Peter. Next question here is from Peter Benedict from Robert W. Baird. Please go ahead. Oh, hey guys, thanks. Um, thanks for taking the question. Um, First question, just can you guys remind us what the store staffing model looks like uh, at this point for sportsmen, maybe the number of employees per store, kind of just how is it generally structured, and how are you thinking about the pay plans for the for the employees where they, I guess you have a handful of stores that are closed, not many, uh, but in the event that you have more closed, what's what's the thought process there? Yeah, high level, Peter, um, you know, our stores vary from 15,000 square feet, well, actually 2,500 square feet now with Legacy, all the way up to 65,000 square feet. So the quantity of associates varies wildly from, call it, 10-ish to probably over 60 or 70 in our larger stores. We do have a fairly high percentage of those employees that are part-time to help us balance the, the demand cycle throughout the week and the month. Um, right now, we are evaluating all of the options in front of us on the compensation, as you referenced it. I believe that some of the government programs are coming to greater clarity for us, and that will help us build and uh, develop our uh, execution plan around that. Okay. That's helpful, John. Thank you. Um, I guess my next question would be, just on the liquidity position, you know, the $46 million, um, remind us the, the revolver terms. Um, I know the availability is a little over $40 million right now. I think it was over 70 at the end of the third quarter. So just remind us, Robert, maybe how, the, how, that, how that sets up and, and, and the, you know, what the, the covenants are, et cetera. Thanks. Yeah, sure. And, and I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Peter, about the current availability. We just reported availability at the end of Q4 2019, and on a normal seasonal basis, that would be a low point for us. And I can tell you we are calculating liquidity and availability on our line about every day, 
and as of today, our availability would be about $82 million. So that's just normal seasonality, and so you, you saw a little bit of a lower number or kind of a depressed number just on normal seasonality. So our availability at, at, as we speak is back up to over $80 million. So um, our, our facility is, is a revolving line of credit that has a maximum amount of $250 million. Uh, and then we had a term loan of $40 million that we have been paying down. And we mentioned what the balance of that was at the end of 2019. I would say that uh, the, 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 the structure, the, the debt covenants, uh, I would describe as covenant light. There's a series of affirmative covenants and some negative covenants. And on the affirmative side, it's, it's very simple things like uh, financial reporting and providing notice of, of certain events, uh, allowing for the inspections of our books and records, compliance with laws, and so on. Um, on the negative covenant side, uh, we're not allowed uh, to incur additional liens or to make certain types of investments or to close or liquidate stores or, or assets or to pay dividends. Uh, and that's pretty much it uh, relative to the covenant, so, so quite light, actually. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thanks. And then I guess my last question is just: Can you talk about the, the capex budget for the year? I know you're not giving guidance, but maybe you could give us a sense for what's already committed this year in terms of capital spend. Um, um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, we. I would say that you sh we should expect sort of normal capital expenditures in this year. It's, it's some of it is associated with the new store growth. And so we've already announced seven new stores. There is some basic maintenance capex. Uh, if you want to consider that committed, you know, it's just something that happens naturally. Uh, and we have some flexibility on that. And, you know, frankly, we've had some deferred maintenance capex, and, and maybe we will choose uh, to defer some in 2020 as we monitor the situation. Um, but sort of a, our, our CapEx this year was about $20 million. That's, that's a normal-ish sort of level of CapEx. We might have a little more than that in 2020 if things progress in a, in a positive way, or we may cut back on capital, but that's a, a general range. Yeah, I think to get to your question, if I may, uh, Peter, if, to, if things were to drastically change because of COVID-19 in our business, we have, a, we have the ability to significantly ratchet back on capital in that plan. Uh, the stores that we're opening or have committed to are much lower per unit in capital expense than stores historically have been, partially because of Field and Stream, partially because the Gander stores were already pretty much physically laid out the way we would lay them out. Uh, some of the maintenance capex we have in the plan could be deferred and would be deferred. And our new DC, which is part of this year's capital plan for opening in 2020, would or could be, it would open in 21. We would start spending capital at the end of this year. Those things, we have some flexibility as we would progress and understand whether or not COVID-19 would have a material impact on the economy and on sportsman's warehouse. Okay, terrific. All right, thanks so much, guys. Good luck. Hey, uh, Peter, one thing I, th 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 I'll mention is uh, one of our analysts, which will go unnamed, uh, did an analysis uh, recently about uh, total availability and, and fixed monthly cash expenses, and I would say uh, it was done pretty well and was uh, pretty accurate, and so I would confirm uh, that analysis. The next question here is from Daniel Hopkins from William Blair. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, nice uh, job. Uh, hope you all are doing well. Um, just uh, wanted to follow up on something earlier, and I missed a little bit of uh, the call, so I apologize if this was asked already. But uh, to the degree that, you know, obviously you've had extremely strong recent results, um, to the degree that that um, uh, – reverses for whatever reason or you have to close more stores can you in addition to the covenants which i think you discussed just some of the other expense 
structure limitations, fixed versus variable. And then on the flip side, you know, what in terms of store labor, uh, you can flex up, uh, you know, if needed. Thank you. Yeah, so Daniel, this is Robert, and I was just uh, making reference to an analysis about what would be considered our fixed cash expenses. And, and the one caveat to that is that analysis does not assume uh, any further actions or any levers that could be pulled relative to our payroll or our occupancy expense, rent, CAM, and so on. Uh, and then if you include our cash interest and other sort of minimum uh, capital expenditures, uh, it is accurate that uh, that, uh, that fixed cash burn is, is probably 18 to $20 million a month for us. Um, again, with the caveat of us not taking other uh, more extreme or, or further actions. Um, and so we feel pretty good about our financial flexibility to be able to weather uh, the potential for negative impact of COVID-19 on our business. And so there was an analysis that said, you know, what if you had to shut down all your stores for some period of time? And that would suggest that we have at least four months of liquidity based on that analysis and without taking further actions. However, I would also mention, recognizing that this could change very quickly, the vast majority of our stores are open. Only a handful of stores have been impacted. And in many cases, uh, governments have identified our business as essential. And not just because of handguns and ammunition. There is a whole variety of products that I had mentioned in, in, in my prepared comments, generators and dehydrated food and propane and so on, uh, that we feel makes our uh, business essential, even in cases where other uh, companies are being closed. Um, so I hope that answers your question in terms of the worst case scenario of shutting down stores and, and kind of how we're viewing that as, as a potential or a possibility. Yeah, that's uh, very helpful. And I guess maybe on the flip side, if, if sales were to remain stronger, I think you addressed this a little bit earlier, but anything besides staffing or, you know, other things on the supply chain basis that you could do uh, if sales were to remain above your prior expectations? Yeah, I think we feel like we're in good shape in, in that regard. It's, it's interesting. We've, we've heard uh, some anecdotal um, stories about uh, companies who are hiring during this time, whether it's Amazon or Walmart and so on. And I think that uh, it, it, with regards to staffing, it is possible that uh, that would be, you know, available to us. Maybe there would be folks who would be looking for work. Um, so on the staffing side, I think we feel good. On the supply chain side, I, I, again, I think we feel like things are getting back to normal. There might be a little gap in the supply chain, chain for the time that the China um, factories were shut down, but our understanding is that's starting to flow again. Uh, maybe there'll be some issues at, at the ports uh, unloading those ships and so on for some period of time. But net-net, we feel like uh, we would be able to uh, meet our customer needs and, and have a, the supply chain flowing and, and, and enough labor uh, to, to take, you know, take advantage and to service our customers. Yeah. I can tell you, Dan, to the point of hiring, we had a few roles we're hiring for in the D.C., and we had 500 applicants to D.C. in less than 48 hours with no marketing um, here in Salt Lake. And historically, that could be weeks of work and marketing and recruiting to get 500 applicants in for our D.C. So there's clearly, a, a, you know, uh, uh, an unemployment um, ramp up that's happening. And, uh, you know, we are in need of a few people here and there, and we believe we're positioned well um, to fill those roles as they become available. Great. Uh, very helpful. Best of luck uh, throughout all of this. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Daniel. The next question is from Mark Smith from Leak Street Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, sorry if I missed this, but can you uh, – quantify or talk more about the impact on gross profit margin from those eight field and stream stores and, and the, uh, the inventory and what you paid for it, how that impacted the quarter? Yeah, so we talked about, uh, or we re 
disclosed at the time that we purchased those eight field and stream stores that we bought the inventory for 88 cents on the dollar. Um, it had a marginal impact to gross margin in Q3 only because uh, those stores only operated for a week or two in, in Q3. We had a full quarter's worth of selling that discounted inventory in Q4, and it in, had the impact of lifting our gross margin percent by about 80 basis points in Q4. On a full year basis, which is really basically just Q4 over the full year, it, the, the lift was about 30 basis points on the full year. Okay. And the uh, two that re were recently acquired, do you expect to have similar uh, type of impact, at least on uh, maybe on a dollar that you paid for, for that inventory? A smaller, a little bit of a smaller impact, only two stores now instead of eight. The discount was more like 8% instead of 12%. Um, and so uh, not as large of an impact, over, especially overall on the, on the total gross margin of the business is uh, maybe hard, harder to, to find in, in the totals. Okay. And, and then can you give us, can you quantify a little bit more kind of e-commerce mix in Q4 and maybe talk about how that trended in Q1? And, and then if you can talk at all about it, you know, maybe what you saw pre-shutting down some of the online ammo sales and how ammo typically mixes as a percent of e-commerce. I'll get, uh, hey, Mark, it's John. I'll give you a high level if I can on that. You know, we uh, last time we disclosed sales from our website, I believe it was 2017 full year, was about 1.7%. Um, I've committed uh, and dis discussed to investors that we'd, we would be at 10% of sales in 2021. That's next year. Uh, not the year we're in, but next year. I'm still very confident in that 10%. Um, we did discuss, uh, I believe, in a, in a couple of sets of materials that during the holiday shopping season this past year, as we saw consumer behavior change materially or even in a greater way from, away from stores, we saw website sales uh, grow over 90% year over year. Uh, some of that was maturity of the website and the team, but it was also an improved shopping experience and a change in consumer buying behavior. Um, I try to give you some color on what we've seen in Q1. We started out Q1, normal operating plan, uh, you know, expecting some nice lift from the exit of the categories by Walmart and de-emphasizing by others. Uh, we were seeing great trends at the beginning of the quarter, and within a few days we saw uh, such an unprecedented run and demand for ammo. We actually had to turn it off from the website. Um, so if you find any ammo on the website, it'll probably be unique to a store, but we are not shipping any ammunition to home. Uh, we started then limiting ammunition in the stores, and I believe today we're at two boxes maximum per day per person, um, and that's um, still under review as to whether that needs to be pulled back even greater to serve as many customers as we can. So I don't believe that any numbers First of all, we're not going to provide breakouts of e-com. That's not in our plan uh, to provide that on a regular basis. And any data I would provide to you, Mark, is anecdotal in Q1 um, is likely not a good baseline to consider. Uh, the numbers just aren't what I would consider uh, sustainable in any business as a growth okay. percentage. Okay. And, and, and that brings up a good point as we look at, at the – current situation in demand for firearms and ammunition, and, and we compare it to 2012 uh, into 2013, you know, this one seems to be led maybe more so by ammunition. You know, you've recently talked about during the holiday season how, you know, peers discounting ammunition, that that's really like milk in a grocery store for you guys. You know, so as we're seeing high demand for ammunition and traffic in stores, are you starting to see what we saw uh, previously, kind of the last go around with ammunition, people showing up daily or weekly looking for when that truck showed up, um, constantly checking in on the stores, looking for uh, new supplies of ammo? Uh, yeah, Mark, I think that generally I would say that's accurate. There are some different dynamics happening now 
because of COVID-19. Uh, you know, we're, we are doing social distancing in all stores. We are doing appointment-based delivery of firearms in certain stores. So there is a, I'll call it a backlog, a physical backlog in most nearly, nearly every store every day. So from a visual, it's hard for me to say that the lines are longer or shorter than they were in 2012 or 13. To your point, though, customers are calling daily to find out what ammunition is available and what personal protection firearms, specifically handguns and shotguns, are available. Uh, we, are, we are dealing with that uh, hundreds and hundreds of calls a day, trying to make sure we serve as many customers as we can. So from that perspective, we are trying to manage expectations for our customers so we don't have every Thursday you have 200 people waiting on the ammo delivery. We are parsing that out in each store to make sure we serve as many customers uh, with good service as we can each day. Okay. And, and then you know, last the, from – go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say our goal – and, again, I, we our goal is to make sure that in the long run we have consistent flow of goods as consistent as we can, serve as many customers as we can, make sure that they become – retained customers in the long run, manage our pricing and our margin to our everyday low price, which has always been the value proposition of this company. Um, and that works well every day of the year. In today's environment, I'm sure there's some customers that wish we had more ammo and don't understand why we don't have more firearms arriving daily. But behind the scenes, our goal is to get this flowing every day and keep it flowing every day. Okay. And, and then last one for me, just looking for an update. Do we still just have, I believe it was four stores earlier this week that were kind of permanently closed? Has there been any change in the last 24 hours or any expectations as, as you look at, at certain geographies over the next couple of days that you expect to be closed? Mark, uh, it's hard to, t to say, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, we've had situations where we've had government um, authorities come in and shut us down, and then two days later, government authorities come back and open us up, and that's just happening in Fresno. Uh, they shut us down two days ago, and now I think this morning they've come back and said uh, they're going to allow us to operate. Um, so we, you are right. We have called a handful of stores, two, three. I think we have three or four stores, Mark, maybe five, that we're not operating at all. We have two or three or four stores where we're doing appointment-only pick up. I, every store is on reduced hours for a couple reasons. One is to make sure we can clean and restock that store before and after, and to make sure we can staff it appropriately. Um, to your point, though, uh, I think we should expect store, more stores could close, more stores could reopen. Every day we have, we have a task force every day that meets twice a day, morning and night, to review the activities by region, by county, by state, by city. And as you know, every one of these 106 locations we have now that are operating have unique elements about their approach to retail, their approach to essentials, their approach to firearms and ammunition. So we are navigating a, a very complex situation right now, and I think the team's done a great job of keeping us ahead of that curve. Okay, great. Thank you for the update. This concludes the question and answer session. I would like to turn the floor back over to management for any closing comments. Thank you. I want to thank everyone again for their time today. Uh, special thanks to all of our hardworking 5,000 plus Sportsman's Warehouse associates who contributed to our success in 2019. We especially appreciate their dedication and effort to our start in 2020 and look forward to continuing to serve our customers in the coming months and years ahead. With that, I will close the call. Thank you. This concludes today's teleconference. You may disconnect your rights at this time. Thank you again for your participation.